Before I get into the Word of God this morning, I want to start with a quote that I've seen on social media today, and it's by Pastor Mick Veach. Um, some of you might know Mick Veach. He actually pastored Stony Creek Church just down the street here, and God called him down to Detroit to start a church called Mosaic Church. And so he's been down there. It's been over a year now. But this quote that he placed on Facebook really caught my attention. And it simply says this, We can search for meaning in many places, but nothing will suffice. It is not until we understand that we were made by God and for God that true life begins. Everything else is a counterfeit and will never be able to deliver. Today, let's begin by giving Jesus our worship, which is our living sacrifice. He came that we would experience life to its full. That gift is available now. Powerful quote, isn't it? Listen, and I want to encourage you today because, again, this message on Christian obedience is so crucial in our lives. And I believe it impacts everybody here, including me. I think we all need to hear this message this morning. And, and, I, and I believe it's going to go into next week also. And, um, you know, the idea of obedience we see from the book of Genesis all the way to Revelations in the Bible. It's throughout. There are so many verses that I could give you this morning. But I don't want to just load you up with verses. You can go home and, again, take your, your study Bible and take the things that you learned and actually look up obedience and see how many times God mentions it in his word. But again, I think about Deuteronomy chapter 11, 26 to 28, and it sums it up like this. It says, obey and you will be blessed, disobey and you will be cursed. And that's a powerful, powerful statement. So what I'm going to do right now, I'm just going to ask God to speak through me. Again, my words don't mean anything, but his words mean everything. So let's just bow our heads. Lord, we come before you right now. And God, that statement I just made is so true. My words mean nothing, but your words mean everything. Your words are life. And God, I just ask, Lord, that as we look at the idea of obedience, the command of obedience, God, I just ask that you just cause us, Lord, to have a heart because that's where obedience is birthed. It's from our heart. It's love in action. And God, I just ask, Lord, cause us to be a people. Lord, that we obey, Lord, because we love you. Cause obedience to be easy. Cause it to be a way of life. Lord, and I just ask, Lord, you just cause me to get out of the way. Lord, speak to my own heart. Lord, even as I'm, I'm speaking what you've given me, so I'm sharing your word today, God. I just ask, Lord, in my heart, Lord, where there's spots that I'm not willing to submit to give up, God, I just ask, Lord, you just convict me through the power of the Holy Spirit. God, I just ask, Lord, you just have your way. Again, we thank you that you're a great, great God. And God, cause us, Lord, never, never to think otherwise. So, Lord, I just thank you today. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Nothing will suffice. Everything in this world is counterfeit. Anything we pursue but Jesus, anything we pursue but God, it's counterfeit. It will never fill you. It will never fill you. And I was thinking about this today, uh, this morning when I woke up. For us to look at obedience, we have to define it. We have to define it. And, and um, for our younger generation here this morning, I actually did this the other day. I said, okay, I said, Siri, what does obedience mean? And we'll see what she answers here. Obedience means compliance with an order, request, or law, or submission to another's authority. Did you guys hear that? Siri's pretty much right on with what I found in the Bible. And, and so I was impressed by Siri's answer. Because again, it is that idea of submission. But I want to give you a couple other definitions here. The general concept of obedience, both in the Old Testament and New Testament, relates to hearing or hearkening to a higher authority. 
I want you to hear that. It's hearing and hearkening. It's listening and doing. It's listening and taking pause. How many parents ever say to your children, listen, you really need to listen to me? Pay attention. Or maybe your husband who's just so enamored with the Michigan football game. Hey, you need to just really listen to me right now. It's important. Listen, today, God is saying to you, listen, really listen. This message is important to you today. Like I said, this message, out of all the messages that I've ever preached, I believe has one of the biggest impacts on our life. It's going to determine where you go and where you end up. That's simple. I believe it's that powerful. It says one of, the, one of the Greek terms of obedience conveys the idea of positioning ourselves under someone by submitting to their authority and their command. Another Greek word for obey in the New Testament means to trust. To trust. I think about that hymn, it's so sweet to trust in Jesus. How many know that? by reality, to where you've been put in a place to where you could do nothing else but trust. And I don't know about you, when you finally get to that place, it is a sweet thing. I don't know about you, but when I get to that place, it's almost like God holds me in his arms. It's almost like he's letting me know that everything's going to be okay if I trust in him. According to the Holman illustration, Illustrated Bible Dictionary, the definition of biblical obedience is to hear God's word and act accordingly. So again, we have that idea of hearing, hearkening, hearing, and acting. Strong's Bible Dictionary simply says this, it's true hearing or obedience. It involves a physical hearing that inspires the hearer and a belief or trust in turn motivates the hearer to act accordance with the speaker's desire. So again, we, we see this thing of obedience is hearing and acting. Hearing and acting. How many know sometimes that's hard to do? How many have ever heard this before? Take the trash out. Several hours later or a day later, Take the trash out, it's overflowing. Hey, take the trash out, there's flies in the kitchen. The idea of obedience is hearing and acting. So I want you to really grasp that this morning before we go any further. It's hearing and acting. So I've got down here summing all these up. So biblical obedience means simply this, to hear Trust, submit, and surrender to God and obey His Word. How many know that today we have God's Word? It's right here. From Genesis to Revelation, God has given us His Word. But how many know that the Spirit of God still speaks today? It'll never go outside of His Word. His word will always confirm it. But we have the Holy Spirit in us that speaks to us today, that still small voice. That if we quiet ourselves, if we again surrender, if we open ourselves to Him, He will speak. He will speak. And if we hear Him speak, we must obey. You know, I was thinking about this every Christmas time. The thought just left my mind. We've been doing the last several years here. Somebody help me here. What do we call it? Advent. Thank you. Advent. Every year we, we do Advent here at the church. We've been doing it. And this year we're going to do something a little different. We are going to do Advent as far as lighting the candles, but not so much the messages this year. Because again, I, I think that we as a body believers here, we know why we celebrate Christmas. But again, we're, we're just going to, again, it's so important, so crucial. But again, 
we're going to take different speakers and different messages throughout the month. But the idea of Advent, that always that first week when I preach on Advent, when I preach about that first week of what we celebrate as Christmas, the month of December, it always brings us back to the thought of our need for a Savior. Always. That's where it has to start. And over the last several years, I've brought out a verse that I don't know about you, but for me, it gets my attention. And that's in Genesis 6, verse 6. Genesis chapter 6, verse 6, where God actually says this, and I'm paraphrasing, that he was sorry. He's seen men's wickedness, and he was sorry for creating man. I don't know about you, but that catches my attention when I read that verse. Every time I read it, I'm so thankful that God showed mercy. And we know what proceeds after that. There's a flood. Again, God make everything right again. And throughout the Word of God, you'll see that happen. But again, it's not until Jesus Christ where things are made right. And today, Jesus Christ through us wants to use you as a world changer to make things right in your world. And the thing is, is, is this, that verse in Genesis 6.6, 6, it's just so powerful. Men became wicked, and he seen their wickedness, and he regretted that he made them. And it was about a month ago, I was out in my deer stand, and my, my family years ago had bought me a sportsman's Bible, very nice Bible, it's tear-proof, waterproof, dirt-proof, I mean, this thing is just really nice. And I was reading just normal Bible reading for 1 Samuel chapter 15. You're going to want to turn there. 1 Samuel chapter 15. And I ran across another verse that really got my attention. And I believe it's a verse that should get all of our attention. 1 Samuel chapter 15. And we're going to start in verse 35 because I believe if we start there, the very last verse in this chapter, it's going to have a huge impact on us. I want to say more than just an impact, but maybe an Im imprint in our hearts today. Because here is this verse again that really caught my attention. And it says this in 1 Samuel 15, verse 35. And Samuel did not see Saul again until the day of his death, but Samuel grieved over Saul, and the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. Here we have again God who regrets. And this time it's just not making mankind, but it's also he regrets of making Saul the king over Israel. I don't know about you, but there's other portions in Scripture when I read them where you actually see where God regrets. And I don't know about you, but it's hard at times to wrap my mind around that. And the reason why you say, well, Pastor Dave, why is that? Because we serve a God that is all-knowing. In fact, He has foreknowledge. He has foreknowledge. He can see forward. And yet he says this about Saul. And to give you a little background about Saul for you that don't know, listen, God's desire was not to even give Israel a king. But they cried out for one. They wanted someone to follow other than God himself. And that alone is so powerful because I believe that can speak to us today. And what I mean by this is, is we today, whether we know it or not, many times we're crying out for something other than God. And as I read in the very first quote by Mick Veach, it's insufficient. Whatever you're crying out for today, other than God, what it truly is is this. It's a small God. It's insufficient. It's never going to meet your needs. Only the true and living God and Son Jesus Christ will ever be able to fulfill you. They will only be sufficient. Nothing else will be. 
And see, we've got to get a hold of that, church. We've got to understand that, again, God is everything. He's the only thing that will ever bring joy in your life. Oh, there will be moments of joy, but they quickly pass. How many of you know what I'm talking about? There will be moments of joy, but they quickly pass. But God offers us a joy that's everlasting, that will always, always be with us. He offers us, again, life and life to the abundance. And listen, it is attainable. It is livable today, even as I read the quote in the beginning. But what I want to do is this. I want to look at 1 Samuel, this chapter 15, because I think it's crucial. There's a verse in here that you've heard me say many times as I've preached, and it's simply this verse, obedience is better than sacrifice. And I was thinking about that. I've used that verse a lot of times here, and it's a true verse. But I don't know if I've really explained it and went into what that means. Because what we're going to do is this. We're going to see a man that God put into kingship because the people's heart wanted to see a king, but they didn't really want to follow God. And it broke God's heart. Listen, God didn't want Saul in that kingship. And again, he didn't hold it against Saul, but his heart was broken, the Bible makes clear. His heart was broken because the people didn't want to worship. And listen, worship is a way of life. If you think that worship is just what we did up here for 20 minutes, you're, you are so wrong. That's only part of it. But worship is what we do out there. And whatever you do, do it unto the glory of God. Yesterday I went deer hunting with my brother. And my intent was to do it unto the glory of God. We had great fellowship. See again, we need to incorporate into our lifestyle this idea of worship. And let me tell you this, brothers and sisters. Obedience always brings blessing. Always brings blessing. Disobedience always brings a curse. Always. I remember working in children's ministry a long time ago, and there was a song that they'd sing. Once in a while, I'd have to fill in the, the little kids' classes, and there was a, a song they used to sing. And, and listen, if you, if you recognize the song, I want you to raise your hand. But it kind of went like this. Obedience is the very best way to show that you believe. I mean, you ever hear that? Miss heard it. <laughs> I didn't make that song up. It was actually a kid's song. Obedience is... I kind of want you to catch this over the next two weeks, so you're going to hear me say it. Obedience is the very best way to show that you believe. There's so much truth in that. Because again, we see the idea of obedience as this love in action. Loving God. How many of you that have kids here today, how many of you love it when you tell your children to do something and you get this? <clears throat> Okay, I'll do it. I remember growing up like that. Listen, I was growing up in a household where I got many. My, my parents believed in spanking. They did not spare the rod. I think you all, I told you all this once before. It might be new to some of you. I remember one year at church in a group called Pathfinders, kind of like a scouts group. We made these keys. We cut these keys out of a key pattern and we screwed hooks into them, and, and they were made to hang keys on. And I remember we, we sanded them, we stained them, we shellacked them, we, we put the hooks in them, and I remember me and my brother gave those to my parents because we were both in the scouting group, and I remember my dad, Christmas morning, opened them up and said, thank you, boys, and took the hooks out of them and said, these are your new paddles, the keys of knowledge. I think about that today, and I just think, man, Dad, whew, that was brutal. I never made my dad anything out of wood after that Christmas. <laughs> but I was one that the rod wasn't spared on, and I, I'm thankful, to be honest. In fact, we used to take spankings in installments 
of five spankings. And my dad always said five was the number of grace. So you get five, and maybe an hour later you get five more, depending on what you did. But the thing was this. A lot of those spankings came because of attitudes that I had. When I was asked to do something, I wanted to fight it. I didn't want to do it right now. In fact, I was many times, many times resistant because I couldn't see the benefit of it. I remember one of the chores I had growing up when a little kid is still a chore I do today. It was cutting firewood and splitting it. And today I've got a nice mall and a nice little power uh, wood splitter that I use. But back then it was chisels and a sledgehammer. I remember I just regretted. I didn't want to do it. And, I, and the purpose for it was to heat our home. That's what the purpose was. It was a good purpose. It was a purpose to bring, bring health. And I, I think so many times in our Christians' lives, what happened is this, is when we get to a place where we don't obey God, it's for one thing, we don't see the end game, what we think the end game should be. How many know that God's ways are so much higher than our ways? I can, I can testify to that time and time and time again. And the reason why I know that is because when Dave tried to do things his way, and got to the point where I just said, I can't do this no more. I seen God move in. I seen the wisdom. I seen his knowledge. I seen that his ways were so much higher than my ways. And I don't know about you, but what in my life, over many, many years of serving God, I've learned to be quicker about obeying. Because I don't want to sacrifice. I want God's best. And I have no doubt, every one of you here this morning, you want God's best. I would say, I see many of you shaking your head, because I know that's what you want. Part of you and the reason for you being here today, even though this has nothing, or I should be careful there, Listen, your righteousness comes through Christ alone. And that's why it's so important if you're sitting here today and you haven't given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that today. Do not wait. Because the thing is, is this, even as I had a discussion with somebody this morning, our righteousness, our righteousness is his filthy rags. But his righteousness is everything. His righteousness and what Christ did on the cross for you will take you where He wants you to be and where He wants you to go. He will fulfill the life that He has planned in you. But we still have to submit. We still have to obey. And how many of you know that partial obedience is disobedience? Delayed obedience is disobedience. And I don't know about you, but I want to be one that obeys. My heart is, again, I love God so much. I want to do what he's called me to do. Because for one thing, I realize it's the best for me. I understand that he's a good father. Many of you have heard my testimony before. I used to see God so distorted. Growing up, maybe it was because keys cut out of wood turned into paddles. I don't know. <laughs> but, but the thing is, is this. I seen God at one time as a God that was just out to get me. Oh, and he's not. He loves you so much. He has so much in store for you. He sees your beginning and he sees your end. And I don't know about you, that inspires me though to want to finish well in everything I do. I want to finish well today. And I don't know about you, but there's days that I don't. Anybody there with me? Last week, I had a day I did not finish well. And as I sat in my bed and asked God for forgiveness, I was thankful that his mercies were new every day. That they're new every morning. And see, listen, no matter where you're at today, today can be the day that you say this. It could be that defining moment where you say, God, I want to start living for you because everything else doesn't suffice. Everything else means nothing. But I want to look at this chapter because I believe the story of Saul here speaks so much to our own lives. So we see that Saul was made king even though it broke God's heart. 
God wants to have personal relationship with each and every one of you. Make nothing God. Whether it's church, religion, false religion. What is the only true religion? We've, we've learned this. Jesus plus anything is, is religion, right? But true religion, it makes it clear in James, was taking care of the orphans and the destitute, right? That's true religion. But don't, uh, don't come to the place where you make religion your God. I, I come to church every Sunday and pastor, I, I'm, I'm a goody-goody and I come Wednesday night too. You should come here for the idea of being equipped to do the good works of Jesus Christ. I've told you many times, don't make me your Savior. Don't make me your Savior because I'm going to let you down. I'm not a good Savior. So the thing is, is this. Don't take these things and turn them into something that they shouldn't be. There's only one and true, one true living God. And I'm going to encourage you today to serve Him with everything. With everything that you have. Let's look at chapter 15. <clears throat> now Samuel, for some of you know, he's a prophet here. He's the guy that delivers the word of God. They did not have the Bible written paper, so God conveyed to use men to speak to his people. And Samuel was a faithful prophet. And this is this, And Samuel said to Saul, The Lord has sent me to anoint you king over the people of Israel. So we see that God's blessing... His intention was to anoint Saul, to give him everything that he needed to fulfill the role that God had given him. And see, just getting that far in this portion of Scripture, listen, God has anointed each and every one of you, and He is, wants to give you everything that he, he, he knows that you need for this life. To be able to walk out what true religion is. To be able to walk out what truly a Christ follower is, to be able to walk out what truly a disciple is. Just like Saul, it says this, he sent me to anoint you king over his people of Israel. Now therefore listen to the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I have noted that Amalek did to Israel in opposing them in the way when they came up out of Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction all that they have. Do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, child and infant, and ox and sheep, and camel and donkey. We see here, and it says in verse 4, So Samuel summoned the people and numbered them and tell them, 200,000 men on foot and 10,000 men of Judah. So we see here, God lays out pretty clear instructions to the prophet. He pretty much says, go and wipe everything out. Spare nothing. Spare nothing. Now, now if you heard that from Samuel, how many of you here would say, that's pretty easy instructions? Oh, it's hard on the same part, right? If you've got a heart. I think the idea of wiping everything out, I mean, that'd be hard. I mean, let's, just, let's not say, try to say that it wouldn't be. I don't know about you, but it'd be very hard for me. But it's very clear. And how many of you know that in obedience, sometimes it seems very hard what God is speaking? Or maybe it seems very impossible. Anybody ever been there? God speaks something to you. And again, we believe that God speaks to you five easy ways. We believe that He speaks to you through His Word, through your prayers, through the Holy Spirit, through circumstances, and through other believers. The last two confirm the first three. Or the three confirm the last two. Don't ever use the last two to confirm God speaking. It's got to line up with the first three. But it seems like when obedience, especially when it's something that's tough, seems so hard, don't it? 
it seems so difficult. And see, I can relate. Saul had a heart just like me. And here he's given this command to go wipe out everything. I'd be sitting there and saying, okay, God, God what, what does the animals have to do with this? Why did they have to be killed? God, the children, really? The children and the women? I, 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 can, I can see the place where Saul's at. I can look into his life, look into his heart and say, that would be tough. And see, today we face similar things. When obedience, when God speaks clearly to us, and and we battle with that, and we say, God, I don't know if I can do that. I remember when God called me into the ministry, I remember arguing with God. (laughs) Out loud, in a car. Saying, God, I can still serve you, but I don't want to be a pastor. I want to be a police officer. You've opened doors for that to happen, God. How many of you know a lot of times open doors does not mean it's the Lord? Be careful. Because I know a lot of Christians today, with no discernment, when a door opens, they walk right through it and say it's God, only to find out that it's not. We have to have discernment, church. But again, when that time of obedience, even though we can't figure it out, I have to believe because Saul was human that he sat back and said, why? Why children? Why? Why animals? How many know that God had a plan? If you would have fulfilled it, things would have been different. And see, it's no different in our own lives. I know there's times where God's speaking to you and you find it to be difficult. And it can be in simple everyday life things. It could be simply go and pray for that person in the store. Ooh, that's a tough, that's a tough one, isn't it? Where you feel the unction of the Holy Spirit, go pray for that person. I go back to the five ways that God speaks to us. I go back and say, God's word says to do it. Confirmed, but still I'm hesitant. And why is that? So we might be embarrassed. Listen, church, we have to get to a point where we no longer are embarrassed. Where we no longer worry about self. We have to get to a point to where we understand if you're not sticking out, if you're not different in this world, you're doing something wrong. We were made not to fit in. Bible tells me that all over. We were made to be different. And in this world that is so cruel today, that's so easy. It's simply opening a door for someone and saying, God bless you. It's simply, I seen something last week that, that, that touched my heart. And this person didn't even know that I seen it. I'm not going to name the person. They're going to know who they are, but it, but I happily happened to, to walk out, I had to get something out of my office as worship started, and what happened was this lady from Debbie Dollar was pushing a cart, and some boxes fell off of it. And I watched one of our parishioners here run out the door, <laughs> go over there and help her pick up those boxes. That was love and action. That was an opportunity And I don't know if that person spoke anything or not. But they were prompted. They were quickened to do something. And see, I'm going to encourage you throughout the next two weeks because, again, I I want to take our time in this subject because it's so crucial. Again, my heart is not just to give you a bunch of scriptures. Scriptures are the Word of God. They bring life. You go home. That's your homework. I'm going to bring some up. But listen, my heart is for you today the same as God's heart. To see us become a people that quickly obey, even when we don't understand. To quickly obey when it seems like it's impossible. When it seems like the mountain's just too big. When it seems like we're never going to get past where we're at, to where we can simply say this, because remember... The definition of obedience. God, I submit. 
God, I trust you. And again, so many times we, 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 we go into it with good intentions, don't we? I'm going to trust God in this. And we're good for the first hour, maybe the first day. We're going forward, God. And what happens is this, is we get our eyes off of Him like Peter, and we start sinking in the waves. And the whole time He's saying this, just keep your eyes on me. Just keep your eyes on me. So we see this dilemma that Saul's in here. Again, Saul had a heart. I have to believe it was a human heart just like mine. So we see that. So Saul summoned the people and numbered them and telling them, 200,000 men foot and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to the city of Amalek and lay in wait in the valley. Then Saul said to the Kenites, Go depart, go down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you show kindness to all the people of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Canaanites departed from among the Amalekites. Again, we see Saul's heart here. We see Saul's heart. This just shows me more and more that he had a human heart just like me. Here was these Canaanites who had been a people that had been kind to the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt. He says, listen, I don't want to kill you. Listen, you, you were kind to our people. Get up, go. And it says this in verse 8. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and devote devoted to destruction of all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fattened calves and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. We have a twist here. A defining moment in this chapter to where Saul disobeys God. He took the king alive, it says. Did not the prophet, God speaking through Samuel, make it clear that he was to kill everyone? Made it very clear. Even though his heart, Saul's heart, might have not understood it. But there was a shift. And this shift right here in verse 8, from here on on, was what caused us to read verse 35. That the Lord regretted that he made Saul king. It was this twist. And see, this morning, I believe that there's some here. And as I've examined my own heart over the last couple weeks, as God has opened up his word to me, I believe that there's things that we're partially obeying God in. I believe some of us are caught up into maybe addiction. And it's because of disobedience. It's where God's asked you to remove something from your life that is destructive. Even though we might not know it. Maybe you've just removed part of it. Maybe you've said to God, I'm going to stop drinking, but the beer is still in the pantry. Maybe it's time to get rid of it. Stop holding on to it. And it said that verse that I read, it says, what seemed right to them. What seemed right in their own eyes. I'm paraphrasing there. What seemed right to them. How many of you realize a lot of times what seems right to us is wrong? I've realized, again, I've said this over over the last five years, I cannot go off of my gut as pastor. Sometimes my gut, when I deal with people, I just want to go in there and say things I, I just want to... Uh, and I sit down and say, okay, God, what do you want me to do? 
God, how do you want me to handle this? Or how many of you have ever had something come against you where somebody was saying something about you and your first initial response was, oh, I'm going to get them. I found myself for the last five years sitting down and saying, God, what is your word? What does your word say about this? What, is, what do you say about how I should respond? How should I handle this? So listen, no matter where you're at in your life, whatever that thing is that you're not letting go of, and God, and you know God's been after it, completely remove it. Follow through with total obedience, and there will be blessing. Blessing always precedes Obedience. Always. There's always blessing. So what is that thing that you're not completely surrendering to God today? It could be your life. It could be the lifestyle you're living in. You know, one of the things, there's several things today that the church has accepted. And I'll just be honest with you, I, we can't accept it. The Bible says it's sin. I, I have to say it's sin. But again, my, my heart is never to condemn anyone, but to love. That's what Jesus did for me. How can my response be any different? And the thing is, is this though, what lifestyle are you living in? Maybe, maybe you, you, you party on the weekend. And, and again, listen, I want to make it clear. We are not a church here. That we, we preach the word of God. You know, I brought up the word or the idea of drinking. I have to tell you, the sin is getting drunk. So for some of you here that have a glass of wine, listen, I, I, between you and God, as long as that's clear, that's good. For me, God has spoke that I'm never to touch alcohol. That's a personal conviction. So I want to make that clear this morning. But again, if you find yourself on, on the weekends or, or the Friday, Saturday night just getting hammered drunk, which is a sin in Scripture, and then coming to church and acting like everything is all right, listen, that is the worst type of life to live. It's a life of counterfeit, of trying to be something that you're not. And God never intended you to live that way. It says a double-minded man is what? unstable in what? All his ways. I don't know about you, but I don't, I don't like to be unstable. Yesterday, me and my brother through our deer hunting, their, uh, the deer hunting property that we lease in Minden City there, there's railroad tracks that go through that property. And we went back because on this property, there's this beaver doing damage. He's flooded this whole part of the property. So we went back there. The idea, we're going to go back there and try to figure out how we can trap this thing. And on these railroad tracks, and, and right now the railroad tracks are, are uh, they're shut off. So just to put your heart at ease. We started playing this little game of balance. Walking those rails. How many of you know, I, I look a little top heavy, don't I? <laughs> My balance is not, I tell people I still am like a jungle cat, but I'm not. And as we started playing this game, walking the rails, I found myself off balance, uneasy, even though I'm not scared, but my footing just wasn't right. And I had big old hunting boots on, and, and as I was walking, I found, and I was thinking to myself as I was doing that with my brother, yeah, 47, 45-year-old guys playing on railroad tracks, I was thinking to myself, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And I thought to myself, I didn't speak it out, but I thought to myself, can you imagine walking like this all the time? Not knowing if you're going to fall to the right or to the left. And listen, though, if you've been there, we have a Savior that's there to pick you up. But again, I believe we got to be careful, church, especially for us that have been walking with the Lord for some time. How many of you know there's time to get off the milk? And get into the meat. It's time to get serious again with your walk. See, initially when you get saved, there's so many things that you've got to learn. 
I remember when I got saved, my desire was to read the Gospels. I wanted to find out who Jesus was. I wanted to know everything about him. Every time there was a teaching, uh, and again, a good biblical teaching always brings it back to teach to Jesus, no matter if it's Old Testament, New Testament, it always brings it back to Jesus. So I used to sit there in, in service, being a teenager, just taking it all in who Jesus was. And then I, I lived it. I experienced him. And I don't know about you, but where you're at today, listen, if you're finding yourself living that life that's unstable, today's the day to say, God, from here on out, I want to live a life of obedience because I love you. Because I love you. See, again, we're going to look at this series, why motive is so important. I remember I brought this up in a sermon a while back. Again, I, I hate to use my wife, but I'm going to use my wife because I only... She's my wife, my only wife. I met, how old were you, hon, when we met? She was 12 years old. So that means I was 13. And, and I remember the first time I seen Missy Courier walk into our church. I was sitting next to my brother that I was on the railroad tracks with yesterday. And I remember looking at her and looking over at my brother and kind of giving him the wink and saying, she's mine. <laughs> and again, you heard what she thought. Some of you heard, at that time I had two broken arms and cast like this. She thought I was mentally impaired the first time she seen me. <laughs> Probably because of the arms and the goo-goo eyes I was making at her. But I love my wife to the point, and our relationship grew to the point that I asked her father to marry me, or marry her three times. <laughs> three times it took before he said yes. Of course, she was still in high school, so now I understand that being a parent. Wasn't intending to marry her when she was in high school. I just knew that I'd found a great thing. And then through prayer, I knew she was the one for me. And we did get married young, 19 and 20. Oh, 18 and, oh, 19 and 18, right? A week later, I turned 20. Mine's a horrible thing. <laughs> and, and so I married her because I loved her. Because I knew that she was what God had for me. And I believe she knew the same thing. And throughout the years, my love for her has grown. I was thinking about this the other day. I can honestly say I love her more than I loved her then. Now, I don't wake up every morning with the thought on my mind that I'm going to cheat on her someday. Never wake up with that thought. But I'll be honest with you, throughout the years of marriage, there has been times where the enemy has spoken into my mind. Anybody else been there? You don't have to raise your hand. I don't want to get you in trouble with your spouse. But I have a feeling that many hands would go up today. And the enemy would say, she wasn't one. I intended for you. He'd speak things like, are you really sure you made the right choice? The enemy. Now I'm wishing I would have helped, had you hold your hands up, so I'm, I'm feeling like I'm getting myself in trouble right now. <laughs> Anybody have that thought? Raise your hand. Okay, praise God. Whew. And for you that were truthful, thank you. <laughs> so, but my point is this. There's been times where I've thought, what would this do to my family? What would it do to my kids? If I wanted to be selfish and do what I wanted to do. I 
had the thoughts of how would this hurt her? I've had thoughts like how would this hurt ministry and the people that God's allowed me to minister to through His strength? What would that do? And see, those are secondary things that I think about. But the main reason why I don't cheat on my wife, the main reason why I'm devoted to her, the main reason that we go through thick and thin, and hun, we have, right? We have. Is because I love her. Because I'm devoted to her. That's the primary reason. And see, motives matter in our obedience. And the first motive should be because we love God. Because we don't want to cause Him to regret anything that He's done or asked us to do. See, because again, we can play sloppy grace here. And I want to get into that next week because I think a lot of times we do. Listen, the statement that Jesus, you can do nothing, you can do nothing because Jesus loved you less is a true statement. But I think we take thoughts and we, we take things, and again, we see truths that aren't there and we, we make it into sloppy grace. I want to put a thought in your mind. Have you ever thought to yourself that maybe God regretted something that He's given you to do? And you didn't follow through. He called you to obedience, but you didn't obey. And therefore, there was sacrifice. You ever have that thought? Or have you ever experienced it? I have. Obedience is better than sacrifice. See, because when we get into this story next week, what we're going to do is we're going to see Saul, who again even to the point that he builds himself a monument of everything that he did. He was applauding himself. And through the God speaking through the prophet, we find out that God's heart was broken to the point of verse 35. I regret making you king. I want to read something to you. Uh, Pastor Terry has passed on some of his teachings to me. And there was a part in uh, Back to the Basics as I've been going through some of his notes that really struck me. And, And the definition that he's got down here for obedience is this. Obedience is doing God's will and requires us to give up our own will. Which implies submitting to his authority and his requirements. Obedience is a command. However, you can rest assured that God never issues a command that cannot be obeyed. It is possible to be obedient. You know why it's possible? Because we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. All things. But again, the only way that this perfect obedience will be lived out in our lives is that our love for Him is above all other. And church, that's where it gets hard. The two commands that Jesus gave us above the ten commands, and Jesus always leveled things up, didn't he? Again, he says this, even if you're angry at your brother, you've killed him. At one time, you actually had to go kill him. He says, if you look upon a woman with lust, you've committed adultery. Okay, man, let's raise, no, I'm not going to do that to you all. We've all been there. He leveled things up. And see, it's no different. Here, the two new commands was what? To love what? Yeah, to love one another and love your God with, we'll paraphrase it, everything. Oh, that's tough, isn't it? You know what it requires? It requires daily submission. Total surrender of my will, as that definition read. 
And that's why I say, church, do, I, I, I do this every morning. I get up every morning and say, God, not my will, but your will be done today. When I don't pray that prayer, I turn selfish. I turn inward. It's all about me and nobody else. Oh, and I have those days when I don't pray that prayer. But I believe if you pray that prayer with a heart of love to God, He's going to grant it. It is possible to be obedient. It is a, it's possible through Christ who strengthens us. So listen, what we're going to do is we're going to close today. But what I want you to do is this. I want you to stand with me. And we've gotten to the point of the story of Saul here. We've seen several points. Listen, Saul had a heart, a human heart, just like yours, beating in your chest right now. I'm sure there was times that he questioned God, even though it doesn't record it. God, why the children? God, why the animals? Why does this have to happen? There was some place in his life that gave gift because he allowed the king. And see again, leaders, people follow leaders. And this is where God's really been convicting my own heart. Convicting my own heart. Because he has placed me here in Momentum Christian Church. So I have to say this. People follow leaders. And I want to be a leader that is total obedience. Listen, I remember the process of getting into this building. A lot of times it didn't make sense, did it, Bill? It didn't make sense at all. But God provided. We didn't see the end game, but God knew the end game. He had foreknowledge. There was people that said, it'll never happen. You will close your doors in a year. I never told you that, but I had people speak that to me. But my God was bigger than that. Obedience is the very best way to show that we believe. I want to show people that I believe God. I don't want to hesitate when he speaks. I want to, listen, use discernment. God's giving you discernment through the Holy Spirit. He's giving you discernment through the Word of God, through wise counsel. God says, seek out a multitude of counselors. But be a person that shows that you truly believe, that you truly trust by obedience. It is the very best way to show that you believe. It shows trust. And I have a feeling here this morning, there's some here that needed to really hear this message, but I believe this applies to all of us. Because I don't want to be where Saul's at. I don't want God regretting that he gave me a task and I didn't follow through. I don't want God regretting. Because listen, God is going to move no matter what, how many of you realize that if God calls you to something and you refuse to step into it, he's going to find someone else. And he will. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to miss out on his best. His best is life. It's more abundant life. Some of you here, you're leading good lives. Working overtime, got a nice car, nice house. You might even have good relationship with your spouse and family. Let me tell you something. It can be better. And that will not suffice the test of time. I've talked to couples that have been married for 30 years that'll say, that doesn't even acknowledge Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior, and they'll say to me, Pastor, we have such a great marriage. And you know what? I won't deny it. But what I will say to them is this. It could be so much better with Jesus in the center. So listen, church, wherever you're at this morning, brothers and sisters, put Christ first today. Leave here understanding that obedience is possible. We have testimony of testimony of testimony in the Old Testament, New Testament, even Jesus Christ who was completely obedient to the cross. Listen, he didn't want to die on the cross. Do you know that? 
when he said, let this cup pass from me. He didn't want to. But what did he say? Your will and not my will be done. He was totally in perfect obedience to the cross. And don't we, don't we have the same power in us? Don't we have the same response to God, our Father? Let's bow our heads as I close in prayer. Lord, right now, as I'm standing here, Lord, Lord, the, the phrase from that song, you're a good, good father. That's who you are. And I am loved by you. That's who I am. Lord, that phrase is so true. And I thank you for that. Because you are a God that loves us so much that you gave your one and only son. But God, you have called us, Lord, to a life of holiness. And we cannot do it in ourselves. As Isaiah said, as Isaiah wrote through your inspired words, our filthiness, our rags, our rags, our righteousness is as filthy rags. So God, we need you. God, I need you. Lord, cause us to be quick. And even though we can't see the end game, even though we can't see how it's going to turn out, cause us to obey. Even if it seems difficult and we don't understand. God, today you're not going to require us to kill animals or people, but God, it, it's living a life for you. It might be just simply going to pray for someone, reaching out, sharing the love of Jesus, sharing the cross to others, which in this day, it just seems so difficult for us to do. But God, Jesus even said, if you love me, you'll keep my commands. And God, that's where it's at. Jesus said it, and he says, if you love me, Lord, cause our love to be a love that is a love that's in action. That it's not about us, but it's about others. So God, I pray this, Lord, whatever there's need to repent, Lord, I ask right now, Lord, that people take that step and they simply say, God, please forgive me. I've been wrong. Lord, you're right. Maybe lifestyles that have been lived, whether it's drunkenness, whether it's fornication, Lord, whether it's any one of those sins, Lord, that you say will not allow us into heaven, God. I just ask, Lord, that you, Lord, move in life. Lord, cause them, Lord, to be obedient, to get rid of it all. And again, it's through your power, through submission to you, Lord, that it'll be done. So, God, I pray for my brothers and sisters right now. Lord, I pray for myself. Lord, cause us, Lord, to be world changers. Lord, cause us to be agents of change. Lord, cause us to be your ambassadors on this earth where you've placed us. And God, if we don't fit in, Lord, cause us, Lord, to realize that, that that's okay. Your word makes it clear that we won't. But your word also makes it clear that we're called to love. So God, I just ask, Lord, do a, do a deep work in our lives. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.